Hi, I'm Adam. This is the Machine Tech video blog, and today I'm machining an air bearing. In the last video, I discussed different types of air bearings and how they work. If you haven't watched that video yet, do it. Do it. Do it. If you have already watched it, it's time to start making a flat aerostatic graphite bearing. Let's review the design. By the way, there's a link in the description to the solid models and prints for this project. The bearing consists of an aluminum body shaped like a short cylinder with a center pocket to receive a graphite insert. The insert has a slip fit in the center pocket and seats against an annulus. The annulus improves stability and load support because it ensures a wide contact area even if there are form errors in the two mating surfaces, and there inevitably will be. An epoxy adhesive retains the insert in the body and seals the gap between the two components so air doesn't leak by. The adhesive joint is strengthened by a couple of simple features. A taper on the outer edge of the insert wedges it into the epoxy, and a radial groove in the wall of the pocket locks the epoxy into the body. Compressed air enters through a plastic barbed fitting into the plenum behind the insert. Plenum is just a fancy word for a chamber which evenly distributes supply air. Finally, a conical hole in the top of the bearing accepts a 3 8 of an inch ball on the end of an adjustable mounting screw. This mounting method is critical because it allows the whole bearing to pivot so the face can always remain parallel to the guideway surface, and it allows for adjustments to the alignment during final assembly. The body starts out as a piece of one and a quarter inch diameter round stock of 6061 T6 aluminum alloy, a very common general purpose grade which takes well to anodizing. I mount the stock in a three jaw chuck on a lathe. About two inches of stick out is adequate. The first operation is facing the end of the aluminum with an indexable carbide tool just to clean up the cutting marks from the bandsaw. I touch the tool off on the face of the stock Move the carriage in a little, and engage the power crossfeed. Op 2 is roughing the outside diameter. I take a skim cut partially down the length of the stock to have something to measure with a digital caliper. It's at about 1 inch 233 thousandths of an inch. I readjust the depth of cut to leave 20 thousandths on the outside diameter for a finish cut later on, and then continue the roughing cut. Op 3 is drilling the center hole with a 3 8 of an inch end mill. Yes, I'm drilling with an end mill. Yes, I realize that's kind of hacky. But no, I'm not sorry about it. It's an effective way to rough out a flat bottomed hole. Although I have to say there are a few points to bear in mind when trying to do this. First, only center cutting end mills can be plunged straight into the material like this. Center cutting end mills have one or more cutting edges which extend to the center of the tool. The other cutting edges are gashed. Second, the end cutting edges of end mills are not square to the tool. That is, they're not perpendicular to the tool's center axis. They're designed with a slight inward taper in order to prevent rubbing inside of the corner. That means that plunging an end mill will not produce a hole with a flat bottom, but rather with a very shallow cone. It's not critical to this application, but it's something to keep in mind when machining features which do require flat faces, like counterbores or spot faces for the heads of fasteners. I plunge in 250 thousandths with a relatively slow feed rate. Op 4 is enlarging the center pocket to a diameter of 1 inch and a depth of 188 thousandths with a 5 16 of an inch indexable carbide boring bar. Incidentally, the shank of this boring bar is made of solid carbide, so it's significantly stiffer than common steel bars. This reduces chatter and deflection with long stickouts and deep bores, or with heavy cuts. Each of these passes has a 50,000 single-sided depth of cut, 100 thousandths on the diameter. I take a measurement. It's at about 927 thousandths, so another cut of 53 and then a finish cut of 20. I face the inside of the pocket. Final measurement, one inch on the money. 
For Op 5, I need to grind a custom 156,000 wide face grooving tool out of high speed steel. I grind the left side of the tool first. This edge tapers inward slightly from the end, so the tool doesn't rub behind the cutting edge. Then, I rough out the right side of the tool. It's amazing how fast the material comes off when using the corner of the grinding wheel. When I'm close to finish size on the width, I finish the edge properly using the periphery of the wheel. This edge also tapers slightly inward. Then, I touch up the end of the tool just to square it up and put in a little relief angle below the cutting edge. What differentiates a face grooving tool from a typical circumferential grooving tool is that it must be relieved or radiused below the outside edge so that it doesn't interfere with the groove as the groove bends around the center axis of the part. Smaller grooves require more relief than larger ones. I go back to the first position, tilt the tool back a little, and grind some off the bottom. Maybe a little more right at the bottom. This way, the cutting edge is the only part of the tool which will contact the material. I check the width with a caliper, 156 thousandths. Nice. And I also make sure that the cutting edge is perpendicular to the size of the tool using a small square. The bright backdrop helps with contrast. You can really see how the sides taper inward behind the cutting edge. Okay. I align the tool and plunge it straight into the part to a depth of 62 thousandths of an inch from the bottom of the pocket. Op 6 is finishing the outside diameter to 1 inch 188 thousandths. I take a final measurement, 1 inch 189. Good. Op 7 is chamfering the inside and outside edges with a 45 degree chamfering tool. This is really just to deburr the edges. Op 8 is grooving the inside diameter. I'm using a 3 16 of an inch indexable carbide boring bar. Again, the shank is solid carbide. I set the tool at an angle to produce a V-shaped groove, position the tool about halfway along the length of the pocket, and plunge it about a 32nd of an inch into the inside wall. Op 9 is parting off. I set the tool at about 9 16 of an inch from the front of the part with a ruler and feed in the parting tool by hand. A parting tool is a lot like a circumferential grooving tool, but it's mounted on a thin blade which can groove all the way to the center of a part to separate it from the rest of the stock material. I use a plastic bin to catch the part. Halfway there. Now we have to flip the part around and finish the backside. Off camera, I mounted some aluminum soft jaws on a three jaw chuck and bored them to the outside diameter of the part. Op 10 is facing the part to overall length. I take a skim cut to clean the face. I take a measurement. It's at about 559 thousandths. So another cut of 49 and a finish cut of 10. Final measurement, 499 thousandths. Okay. Op 11 is chamfering the outside edge with a 45 degree chamfering tool. I feed the tool in to a depth of 40 thousandths. Op 12 is drilling the cone for the 3 eighths of an inch ball mount with a 90 degree solid carbide spot drill. The diameter at the mouth of the cone should be about 365 thousandths so that the ball sits at the correct position. The lathe features are done. Getting close. There's still the threaded hole for the air supply fitting, for which I'm going to use a milling machine. I clamp the part in a vise. Then, I use an edge finder to locate the center line of the part. I find the front of the part and position the spindle 300 thousandths from the edge. Op 13 is spot facing the hole with a 3 eighths of an inch end mill. Op 14 is pre-drilling the hole to the correct size for a number 1032 tap. Normally, that would be 159 thousandths, the diameter of a number 21 drill. But the tool will have to sustain an interrupted cut in the section of the hole where it goes through the plenum, so I'm using a 532nd of an inch end mill I had handy. The end mill won't deflect nearly as much as a drill would. I drill to a depth of 438 thousandths of an inch. Op 15 is tapping the number 1032 threads. There's a slight pucker factor when power tapping a blind, interrupted hole with a gun tap, but I came through unscathed. I unclamp the part, 
remove it from the vise, and deburr the threads. All the machining operations for the body are complete. But let's do something about that awful bright finish. I use Scotch-Brite surface conditioning pads to scuff up the outside surfaces. I start with a rough pad and then switch to a finer one. The random pattern of fine scratches results in a matte finish which hides blemishes well and which I think looks good on aluminum, especially anodized aluminum. It may also help prepare the surface for anodizing by removing some of the oxide layer which forms on the surface of the aluminum. I also scuff up the inside diameter of the pocket with some 80 grit emery cloth to give the epoxy more nooks and crannies to fill. Mechanical interlocking is a big part of what makes a strong adhesive joint. One final detail. Remember that the bearing is going to be mounted with a 3 8 of an inch ball in the cone on its top surface. The ball in cone is a pretty good ball joint, but it has some weaknesses. If I paint the inside of the cone with a marker, install the ball and rub it against the cone, you can see that the ball makes circular line contact with the cone. But the cone is guaranteed to be imperfect in its form, especially since I just machined it with a spot drill. The ball won't touch every point on the circle, and the actual points of contact are unpredictable, so the ball could shift around slightly in the cone. Ultimately, this translates into an uncertainty, albeit very small, in the bearing's exact position relative to the machine component to which it's mounted. When it comes to sub-micron precision, every little bit of cumulative error has to be accounted for. The ideal design for a ball joint is a ball-in trihedral or three-sided socket. It provides the three points of contact required to minimally constrain the ball in a stable deterministic way, while supporting axial loads and still allowing for rotational movement. Unfortunately, it's a pretty difficult geometry to make using conventional machine tools. David Price got away with it in his design because he 3D printed the bodies for his bearings. Another point to consider is that both of the aforementioned ball joints are susceptible to deformation under high loads, from, say, the weight of a machine tool carriage, or the forces from a cutting operation, because all the stresses are concentrated at single points or lines. This flexibility in the material leads to deflection in the machine. There are two ways to deal with this problem. One, make the contact surfaces out of a very hard material, or two, increase the area of contact. The ball is made of hardened steel, but the body is made of aluminum, which is relatively soft, in order to simplify manufacture. Luckily, there's an old instrument maker's trick which increases the area of contact and improves the quality of the contact surface. I take the ball and press it into the cone with an arbor press. This generates a spherical annulus with the exact size and shape of the ball and a very smooth surface. Okay, the aluminum is ready for anodizing. Let's machine the graphite insert. The stock is one inch diameter rod of some mystery graphite that I found on eBay. I know next to nothing about this stuff except that it was described as sinker EDM electrode material and it was cheap. One of my goals is to show that the exact grade of graphite isn't really that critical, but I'll discuss that later. I mount the stock in a 5C collet chuck on a lathe with about one and a half inches of stick out. Machining graphite is a very messy business, so I lay down some shop towels. Okay, a lot of shop towels. And I use magnets to hold them down. I also set up a shop vac to remove dust right next to the cutting tool. The first operation is facing the end of the graphite just to clean it up. Touch off, move in, take a cut. Op 2 is cutting the taper using the compound slide, which is set at 5 degrees. The length of the taper should be about 3 16 of an inch to leave about 1 16 of an inch of full diameter on the finished part. Op 3 is parting off. I set the tool at about a quarter of an inch from the front of the part with a ruler and feed in the parting tool by hand. I use a needle nose plier to pop off the parting nub. And there you go. Pretty straightforward. 
The body is ready for anodizing, and the graphite insert is ready to be epoxied. That's enough for this video. Stay tuned for part three, and as always, I hope you learned something.